Welcome everyone back to Cat's Eye on the Future. Tonight's show, we're going to have our regular guest, Kveldoffer Gunderson, back for another visit. And tonight, instead of talking about predictions or runes, we're going to take a little different topic and we're going to talk about healing in the Nordic traditions. Now, Kveldoffer is unusually qualified to talk about this because not only does he have a PhD from Cambridge UK in Old Norse Studies, but he's also trained as an herbalist and he's currently in his first year at medical school at RCSI in Dublin. And with that, I'm just going to let him go ahead and start and we can ask questions later. Over to you, Kveldoffer. Okay, well, um, healing in the Northern tradition um, is actually one of the facets um, of Northern culture and belief um, that we, we have um, a particular, particularly large amount of evidence for. Fortunately for us, in the Anglo-Saxon period, there were a, a number of monks who very kindly wrote down all of their herbal healing recipes together with the additional directions, which um, included um, a number of charms, a, a few of them um, seem to be pure heathen, um, quite a number of them are mixed in, in interesting and challenging ways. Um, some of them are Christian, but even those are, are valuable um, in the, the magical um, principles um, on which they were composed um, are fundamentally the, the same ones um, that guided the evolution of the heathen charms from that culture. Um, and so they can still be um, analyzed and, and considered in, in the light of their basic principles. Um, we also, from Scandinavia, have a number of descriptions of, of healings of various sorts in, in the sagas, um, although generally not nearly so well detailed. Um, and unfortunately, incantations are seldom given um, in full. And of course, there is a, a huge amount of folkloric material, um, some of which, as best as we can tell from the archaeological um, and uh, other written evidence from the heathen period, probably preserves customs certainly as old as the Viking Age, and quite possibly in some cases, um, such as the use of the axe, and particularly the Stone Age stone axe, um, as an amulet or healing tool, um, may be much older than the Viking Age. An axe is a healing tool. That, that's intriguing. Can you explain a little bit about that? Well, I can and I will, and I'll get back to it, um, because this is a actually ter terribly important to one of the mainstays um, of Germanic healing theory. Now, d the Germanic view um, of disease in particular um, was fairly well defined. Um, diseases were usually seen as um, either personified directly as worms, um, or they were seen as indeterminate um, flying venoms, flying veils, um, po possibly, po possibly of a white-like nature, um, something that could be personally addressed, um, personally driven out. Um, very common was the belief in disease being caused by untoward whites of all various sorts. Um, the probably the the most widespread and thoroughly grounded um, belief of this type was the belief in what's most commonly known as elf shot. Um, it's also also called wit, wit shot, troll shot, um, and the Anglo-Saxon um, poem against charm against a su sudden stitch um, actually refers to the shot of Aesir, um as well as the shot of hags. But in, in all cases, the idea is that. A supernatural being who has it in for you for whatever reason um, has shot you with a, a little tiny arrowhead, which is thereby causing your sudden stitches, a aches, chronic pains, fibromyalgia, whatever it is you've got. Yeah, I think I've heard L shot used a lot of times in novels and things to refer to a stroke, which it certainly makes sense in that context. Yeah, stro stroke was what was one of the most common conditions defined as L shot, but also um, arthritis. Um, was very very commonly described as elf shot. Anything that would come on suddenly, possibly catastrophically, and send shooting pains um, for no obvious physical reason. Did they have any other theories about disease and how that worked, or was it primarily on based on elf shot? Um, it was based on elf shot. I mentioned the flying bales, um, which are certainly con contagious, airborne, 
um, and possibly conscious beings infiltrating the body. Okay, um, and I'm getting of course this the worm of, could infiltrate you. I'm getting this image of flying bales of hay. Can, can, yeah. Can, oh, ba bale in the in the sense of, of evil of poison. Sorry. Okay. No, it just I, I knew that couldn't be what you meant, but it was just this this image of ba hay bales flying with ribbons on them and the little darts in front. But you know, but that that leads us to the question. Well, um, if if you have a disease, um, what do you do? Um, this um, otherworldly pathogen, um, and indeed actual pathogen, have invaded your body. How do you get rid of it? Well, um, now I'm going to say something that may surprise quite a lot of people. 98% um, of the time, I would betcha if you ask an Ausa true person, um, what deity do you ask for help in healing, they'd say air because Snorri Sturluson, in his prose edda, described Air as Frigg's handmaiden and, and the physician among the gods. Um, aside from that, and one reference um, in Fjölvin's Mál, um, which has Air as a handmaid of Minglid on, on um, her, her mountain of healing, her mountain of magical healing, again suggesting a relationship with healing, we don't know anything else about Air. Um, she's mentioned casually in a couple of kinnings, um, the type of kinnings where you could substitute any supernatural female's name for them, so that doesn't tell us anything. Um, was she really widely worshipped, or was she just, did Snorri see this in, um, feel in Fjölvin's mouth and, and build things up from there? We don't know. But what we do know is that the god our ancestors were most likely to call on for help in healing was actually Thor. And if you look at, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't look at Thor initially and think, Dr. God, you just wouldn't. Um, but when you, when you look at the view of disease as an untoward otherworldly white invading, messing with your body, well, who are you going to call? <laughs> The guy with the hammer. Yep, you're go going to call the guy guy with the hammer uh, to drive it out, and you see exactly that um, being done in um, several of the charms, um, particularly charms against infections and wounds. Um, the Canterbury charm, for instance, um, is an address um, to a, a um, Thursoretan by the name of um, Gural. Um, who is associated with wounds and wounds infection, and the Canterbury charm reads, Gural wound causer, fare thou now, you are found. Thor hallow thee, thirsts Dryden. Gural wound causer, against blood vessel pus. Um, in this case, the hallowing of Thor, the word you used is, is vigi, um, a partic particular type of hallowing associated with Thor, with his hammer, um, with setting things into a state of special sacredness. And in this case, instead of um, blessing the object of the hallowing, Thor is actually driving out the object of the hallowing, that is to say the Etan Gyrl, who is responsible for the infection, who is, if you like, and I do, um, the otherworldly personification of, um, I, I guess, possibly, probably Staff Aureus. Um, very likely Staph Aureus. Which is not my carrying a staff, correct? Uh, no, sta Staphylococcus aureus, um, one of the most common diseases uh, or co common bacteria getting into wound infection, most recently infamous for the um, MRSA, the methicillin-resistant Staph Aureus strains. Which um, has been killing people in hospitals yeah. and being very difficult to treat. Right. Um and if you look at it from a Norse point of view, um, you, you would say, okay, well, um, Gerl has learned some new tricks, um, and it's time to call on Thor and also have a look to see what other um, herbal or, or magical medicinal preparations, or indeed non-magical medicinal preparations, um, can assist in this process. So they were not only using magic or divine intervention they were also had a, a pharmacopoeia of, they of... they had an extremely fine pharmacopoeia um and in fact there've been um a number of recent studies done on some of the herbs mentioned for instance in the anglo-saxon sources um with quite spectac quite spectacular discoveries um plantain um burdock creeping cinquefoil and common agrimony all all of which play a significant role in the anglo-saxon pharmacopoeia have all been shown to be 
um, quite effective against gram-positive bugs, both Staphylococcus and Streptococcus. Um, Cinquefoil root also had significant activity against gram-negatives, including E. coli and Pseudomonas erugacina, um, which is often seen in hospitals. It's one of the um, main concerns as a cause of pneumonia um, in people on ventilators, for instance, and, and it's very, very difficult bug to get rid of. So these natural plants, in the absence of particularly modern antibiotics or in the face of modern antibiotics not working even, actually have properties that in fact fight disease. Absolutely. And it, in fact, some, some of the... Um, Directions for preparation. Um, surprisingly, you see, you read, and you take these, and you must stir them in an iron pot or with a copper spoon or whatever. And you would look at that, and you would you would think that it was um, being done for magical purposes. Well, it may have been, um, but um, the um, metallic admixture, the the iron salts um, or the copper salts, um, also may very well have had a, a significant contribution to the physical effectiveness of the medicine. Um, now, did, did the early Anglo-Saxons know that this was what they were doing when they stirred um, their herbs, boiled them up in an iron vessel? I don't think they did. Um, but, you know, our ancestors were not stupid. They observed things. They saw what worked better, um, and they did it. I know from doing like medieval cooking that so they've done some research on some of the few recipes that we have that will say something like boil this egg will you say three ave marias well if you know how long the period version of that is you have to know of course what they're referring to in this case it's it's a it's a christian sort of charm but that if you know the amount of time very often it is exactly the same amount of time that my modern cookbook would say and take your egg timer and cook it for three minutes yeah and that you know, that was probably, in fact, I'd say that was almost certainly one of the reasons um, for the various charms, the various incantations, because among other things, they could serve as timers. Um, the other thing, though, and the one that may even be more relevant to modern practice, um, is the effect um, that saying a, a charm, a spell going through the ritual, as well as providing the herbs with the physical effect, um, had on the patient and indeed on the doctor. And at this point, we're in the area where, you know, if you look at it from one point of view, um, if you look at it from kind of the strict scientific um, view, let's not consider anything we can't solidly prove by scientific method, you can say, okay, this is placebo. Um, and most people hear placebo and think that it's, you know, meant to be a dismissal. It's a placebo. There's nothing real in it. You know, better than placebo, better than nothing. Um, but the placebo effect um, is a very, very real and significant effect. Um, if it weren't, we wouldn't go to such huge trouble to exclude it when we're trying to determine um, the physical effectiveness of a new drug. Um, and one of the interesting things that has come out in placebo studies um, is that there's actually two people's beliefs involved in the effectiveness. One of them is the patient, of course. The other one is the doctor. Um, they, they did some time ago, ago a study in which um, e essentially it was a double blind with a twist. Um, the doctors um, thought th that they were giving um, the actual drug to some patients and not others. In fact, it was all, all placebo for this test. But when the doctors believed um, that they were giving the real drug, those patients actually showed a, a significantly greater improvement. So you, you can ask yourself, you know, okay, um, did the patient subconsciously pick up the doctor's confidence? Maybe. Um, was it the doctor's spiritual force, mental force, magical force, unconsciously more strongly directed because they believed it was um, the, the actual drug? Maybe it was. You know, scientifically, um, you can't make a distinction, and in practical terms, I'm not sure you need to. But what, what is absolutely certain um, was that if you were an Anglo-Saxon um, with a condition um, and you went to a healer, um, they would perform a, a ritual which both you and they believed in very strongly, um, and you would have that added benefit 
um, to the actual herbal preparation you were getting. Um, it was a bit, so it was, it was a, in general, a very holistic approach, if you like. The, the idea um, was that you had something originating in the other world, um, having a physical effect, and so you had to deal with it both physically um, and supernaturally. So I think maybe it sounds like the Anglo-Saxons had an understanding of something that maybe modern medicine is, to, at least in the West, to some degree, it's just re sort of learning, which is that there is, a, is if you will, from a scientific perspective, a, a, phys, a, a mental, if not exactly a spiritual component to healing. And interestingly enough, it seems to go both, on both sides. It's not just the patient's. Yes, belief. that that was the the shocking thing to me that that um, the doctors believe had a placebo effect on the patient, and again, you you know at that point you you choose which explanation you like, um, but either way it comes up with the the same result, um, which is that um, you the the more you are able to do to to address the problem on every level of the patient's being, the more effective the treatment is likely to be. Now, I notice that you're very often referring to the Anglo-Saxons. Is that because we have, they're the, the uh, source we had the most information from? Yes. Um, they're the ones that left us the ni nice recipe books, charm books, leech books, what have you. Um, so they're, the Anglo-Saxon herbs um, are the ones that the most study has been done on. Um, because it's very, very straightforward to say, okay, plantain appears in this, 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 being used for this, 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 let's have a look at it and see what it does. Um, whereas there's not a huge amount um, of direct Viking Age information um, about herbs, herbal medicine. We, we see the occasional references and we get the occasional find in grave goods. Um, which lets us know that they were definitely doing it. They almost certainly had um, a well-developed traditional pharmacopoeia, but unfortunately it just wasn't, wasn't the sort of thing that got written down, whereas the Anglo-Saxons, you know, did, did a splendid job for us there. Getting back to the uh, theories of disease, did they have anything that, for example, like what we would consider, say, mental illness or... Yes, um... And again, uh, back to the Anglo-Saxons, um, they um, often thought it was call, caused by elves. We actually have this word which translates roughly as elf sather, elf malicious mental magic, um, and there there were treatments for that. Um, in that that case, um, one one can assume that um, the goal was primarily um, mag magical, spiritual. Um, but they, mental diseases were, were recognized as diseases in, in the same way as others, um, and largely treated in the same sort of ways. So again, it's an attack of some sort from the other world. Yes. Um, if you, for instance, and we see this even more so in the sagas, um, there's an example in Gunnar's saga, Keldeknut Fiffles, really that's the name of the saga, couldn't make it up, in which a, basically a guy's killed a woman's brother, she doesn't have a man to take the case to court and get Weregild out of him, he refuses to pay it, so she performs Sather and basically inflicts a massive case of obsessive, obsessive compulsion on him. Um, he, he's incredibly restless, he keeps you know running in and out and back to the same place, and he is tormented um, by this obsessive compulsion, until he actually does the right thing, pays up. So it, it sort of basically is the the, anti the the exact opposite of healing somebody. You're actually inflicting something on them. Yeah, but that say them for you. Um, yeah, but there is there. I know in some traditions, like in West Africa, a lot of disease is thought to come from somebody cursing you or. Something. Oh yes, we ha we had loads of that, and and the approved treatment. Um, was generally to attack the the magic worker, and there's an, a number of, of runic inscriptions, um, some of them fairly rude, you know. So um, symbolic sexual aggression w was not exactly uncommon um, when it came to Nordic combat magic. So combat magic sometimes crosses over with healing magic. Yes, um, because in... And again, this is back to Thor and back to the axe that everyone has been hang metaphorically hanging over everyone's head since the beginning of the interview. Because if you're if you're 
dealing with a, a um, being which wishes you ill, and I think you can take this whether it's an ill-willing elf or a bunch of um, Staph aureus bacteria, you know, one way or another, you have to either fight it, kill it, dr or drive it off in some manner. Um, and this probably explains why Thor, and certainly explains why Thor was most the most commonly called on for healing, because um, he was the, the god for that. Um, now, the stone axes in particular, first, um, by the Viking Age, um, you know, it had been kind of forgot that once upon a time we used to do all our work in stone. Um, and so these axes were seen as um, thunderbolts, um, as stones that were left when the lightning had struck, uh, obvious link to Thor. You know, these little stone arrowheads were often understood to be elf shot. Um, but the, the axes, the thunderstones, those were particularly powerful. Um, and in fact, they were being used in this manner um, in the Viking Age already as healing amulets. Um, we know this because we found a Stone Age axe in Denmark in an area called Veilby, um, which in the Viking Age um, was wristed with a rune, um, which is largely incomprehensible, but the first element is the leaf word, L-Y-F, um, which indicated magical healing, herbal healing, um, amuletic healing. Um, it's ki kind of a wide word, but the, the um, basis of it comes from, from herbal magical healing. Um, and so somebody had taken the, this item, um, inscribed it with a rune involving healing, um, almost certainly used it in the same way as these same objects were being used um, in later Scandinavian folklore. And Variously, you could strike sparks off the axe into water or grind a little bit of it in water and give it to the patient to drink, um, or dip it in the water and chant a bit, um, making a, a sort of um, gym elixir, if you like that particular horrible modern term. But in all cases, um, the axe was quite possibly the original form of Thor's hammer. Um, it continued to be... Um, conceptually and probably in amuletic use um, linked with Thor th throughout the end of the Viking Age. It retained its protective and healing by means of protection powers um, through the 20th century. I find it really fascinating to think of the idea of Thor as both smashing big giants and and sort of stomping on little ones. Yes, and you know, it's one, one of my um, ways of looking at things are um, to consider how the gods work through different parts of the body, um, and Thor and Loki together are kind of the immune inflammatory system. You know, Lo Loki is really responsible for inflammation, um, and you you think bad thing, you know, everyone buys anti-inflammatories. Well, without inflammation, your immune system couldn't work. Without a good inflammatory system, you die. Okay, um, the inflammatory system basically facilitates the immune system, and not a, a little bit ironically or perhaps appropriately, one of the main cells um, involved in the, the first immune response is called the macrophage, the big eater, which just, you know, chews up the invading bacteria. And whenever I hear big eater, you know, I always think of Thor you know, go, going in, stomping, pounding hole, holes in the enemy. Um, so they die, or else just chomping them all together up. So once again, Loki does something that may be somewhat annoying or even painful in the short term, but he's but actually... is absolutely crucial, you know. And of course, if Loki gets out of hand, you get autoimmune diseases, which are kind of like Ragnarok in your body. Um, but with, without him, you know, you'd be in a awful lot worse trouble. So we know something now about the Germanic theory of, of disease, essentially, but did they have any sort of surgery or any sort of way of treating battle wounds or something? I oh, know. yes. They, they were actually, um, you know, time, place, okay, um, but quite skilled surgeons. Um, one of the most classic examples is the, the use of onions to tell um, if a man who'd received an abdominal wound was going to live, or if his guts had been perforated and he was going to die horribly. Um, <clears throat> if, if you had a, had a patient with a stomach wound, um, you didn't know if his, his um, entrails had been pierced. 
you fed him a bowl of onion stew. Um, and then you waited a couple of hours, and then you went sniff, sniff around the wound. Uh, the wound. And if you smelled onions coming from the wound, uh, that, that was it. You know, time to start digging the burial mound. If you didn't smell any onions, the gut was intact, and you could sew, hit, sew him up, put a load of plantain or, or something, and maybe some leeks and garlic, which, you know, also have profound antibacterial uses, of which the Norse were, were aware, um, and, you know, hope for the best. Did they have any painkillers of any sort that they used beyond, say, mead? Um, mead would be the main one. It, it is possible. We know that the Anglo-Saxons and in continental Germany at the time, um, hemp flowers were, were being used um, as um, analgesics. Um, we don't know whether the Norse were, were using hemp flower medicinally or not. Um, it seems reasonably likely um, one of the Osberg women was buried with a, a leather bag of hemp seeds about her neck. Um, they were certainly holy. What we don't know is, was it because of their medicinal uses, um, their use as a very valuable textile, because flax, of course, was you know hugely magical, um, or was it both? Um, now, the Norse were in a, a good bit of contact with the Middle East at this time, um, where hemp was also being used as an analgesic um, and for, for many other purposes. Um, so it, it seems unlikely that from one direction or another they had not picked it up. We, we can't be absolutely certain. Um, it's unlikely that they often had access to opium. That was going to be my next question. Yeah, the, the Anglo-Saxon... They probably did occasionally. The Anglo-Saxons were able to get it um, as a fairly rare but by no means unknown imported thing. So uh, one can assume that, that the Norse um, might well have as well. But it, it, would, it would not have been common. Now some other plants that might have been used um, almost certainly were used variously as anesthetics. Um, were rather less safe, um, specifically henbane and deadly nightshade. And the fear cat witch w was found with a load of henbane seeds on her, as well as a number of interesting items suggesting she was a magical practitioner. Um, whether she was using them for entheogenic purposes or, or whether she was using them as a healer, we don't know. Um, likewise, belladonna, deadly nightshade, can be used in small quantities as an analgesic, as can mandrake. Um, don't try this at home, kids. So, what were there other roles? Or you mentioned that the hemp and possibly being used. Um, you used a big long word, but I think you meant recreationally. Or it, well, no, in, in, inspirationally. Yeah, by entheogenic, I mean specifically um, consciousness altering, used for spiritual purposes. Ah, because that was going to be my next question. Did they? use mushrooms or funguses but either in healing or for theogenic for theogenic purposes i don't know of any uses of mushrooms for healing purposes um i i don't think it has been, been recorded um did they use them for entheogenic purposes maybe um the burial in huggum um sweden migration age included a drink um comprised of, of mushrooms and birch bark um, but unfortunately, those excavations were done some years ago, and I don't think they were able of doing an analysis of the specific type of mushrooms at the time. Now, we know that the Sami with whom the Norse were in considerable contact um, did occasionally use fly agaric um, for shamanic rituals for entheogenic work. Um, the Liberty Cap, a form of mild psilocybin, grows throughout Scandinavia, and it seems unlikely that they would have been unaware of its properties um but you know there there's absolutely no no proof either which way um and at any any rate um unless they were being used um for healing me mental disease as part of a ritual um for for dealing with um a, a curse if you like a mental disease um I can't think of an awful lot of, of good um, that the Liberty Cap would do anymore. Well, the reason I asked was because there's been a few things you know, you see all kinds of things on the internet. It must be true, quote unquote. But it flo an idea that floats around that berserkers were for some somehow using mushrooms to get a yeah. berserker rage. Uh, the, the that particular myth has been around for 
since I think the late nineteenth century when someone got a romantic bee up their bonnet and no they didn't. Um first off, um there are a number of examples of the berserk rage coming on unexpectedly, inappropriately, and in totally undesired circumstances. Um we even see one guy, you know, going to great efforts to try to get rid of his hereditary berserker gong. Um so obviously this was not being this was not something that you went out and deliberately invoked by taking a mushroom or anything else. This was something that happened to you. Um, and secondly, Fly ha has a number of, of interesting effects, um, but I, I think I've never tried it myself, um, but I've talked to um, a number of people who have. I have read up on it. Um, and it is extraordinarily unlikely that it would produce something resembling a state of berserker gong. You know, it is just possible that maybe, maybe, um, if, you know, if you accept the men's band, um, berserk band connection thing, which, which actually seems relatively plausible, maybe they could have been used in the initial, um, initiation, um, to help the initiatee, um, Op open the way to his bear fetch or his wolf fetch, but you know, at, at this point, we're way off in imagination land. There's no way to prove that they even had initiations, let alone. But bringing it back to imagination land and returning to the idea of, me of their traditional medicine as opposed to Western medicine, would they at the time? I, I think that probably a modern psychiatrist would probably see berserker as a sort of mental condition of some sort, or maybe yeah. not? That's a good um, question. It's, yeah, it's one of those things I don't think anyone really quite understands it. Um, it's it's a, a burst of hysterical strength with um, some other interesting effects. You know, you get massive vasoconstriction, so wounds don't, don't bleed as badly while you're in the fit. You know, this sort, sort of massive, I guess, sy sympathetic nervous stuff in which you can do these things that, you know, would, would normally seem, seem inhuman, and then you just completely collapsed. If you were older, more fragile, um, you might even die as a result, as, as the original Feldolfer did. Um, he actually died of exhaustion as a result of a, a berserk fit at quite a great old age. Um, but the same is true for the bursts of hysterical strength, the classic mother lifting a car off her child. Um, the human body can do vastly more um, than we normally think it can, but mostly going to the limits is really not very good for you at all. And, and this... for some reason, some for some reason, some people under physical threat, under anger, they flip it. They flip into it. You know, some people can have the most horrible things done, done to them and never get near it. You know, there's there's just no telling. It, it, it may be psychological factors. It may be physical factors. I shouldn't like to ha have to float much of a theory. Yeah, and this is probably leading into a topic we may come back to on another show, but I've heard rumors, I've never been in the military myself, but that this is something actually that modern militaries recognize can happen, but try to avoid. They they actually actively try to avoid people. That, that yeah, of course we want this. to avoid it, because, you know, if you're, try if you're trying to run a battle, ha having soldiers just completely lose it, fail to hear, obey, um, or pay the slightest attention to orders or plans or anything, you know, that this is non-optimal. I think given the level of interest, we should probably leave this for now, but perhaps do an entire show maybe on berserkers and warrior traditions. Yeah. I thought it would be very popular. But All the music used on the show today is from MusicAlley.com, your source for free-to-air music for podcasts. The artists place their music up for free-to-air in hopes that you, the listener, will visit their site and purchase some of their outstanding musical offerings. So after the show... Why not visit musicalley.com and explore their extensive playlist? She and she sings. She goes home in the evening with the dew all on her wings. Do you have questions? The cards have answers. If you would like a personal reading with Melody, just go to my website, MelodyPsychicReadings.com, that's Melody with an I, PsychicReadings.com, for information 
or email me at melodyreader at gmail.com. Readings are available using Skype, phone, email, or even in person if you are lucky to live in Ireland. Why not find out what special messages the cards have just for you and book a private reading today? So, now we talked about berserking and we talked about uh, various aspects of healing, but from the viewpoint of, say, being a Germanic uh, healer of some sort, uh, what we would call a doctor or a wise person, I present to you and I'm sick. What would you do? Okay, well, you're, you're sick. You, you, um, here I am. I'm an Anglo-Saxon. Um, I'm probably um, either a monk or a learned man, because by the time these leech books were written down, um, a lot of the practical function of healing ha had been taken over by the church. A lot of people, of course, were, were still um, performing traditional healing, um, but the, the church seemed to have um, a, a fair grip on it. Um, but I'm also a guy who's been trained as a healer um, in this old tradition, um, so I know that there are um, things in, in the, a charm that, that I shouldn't mess with because this is the way it goes and this is the way you've got to do it if you want it to work. Um, and here I have this woman come in um, and she, she's got um, some red blisters on her face, um, she's got a sore throat, she's r running a fever. Um, now, first off, I know that this is probably a flying venom of some sort. Um, because she's not the first patient who's um, come into my uh, monastery or my cell or whatever with this. It's, it's obviously something contagious. It's going around. So, so flying venom is what you'd use for a contagious disease? What yeah. Um, basically, contagious, probably airborne disease. Um, it's a flying venom. Okay, so um, I, I think about um, what she's got and... Um, I'm looking for something that's going to deal with the venom itself that will drive it out. Um, and I'm also may maybe thinking of um, something that involves herbs that will soothe her blisters, keep them from get it getting infected, um, cut down on the pain and, and itch and discomfort some. You know, her herbs may maybe that will help bring her fever down a little bit, um, relax her some. And what I choose to what I, I choose to treat her with is the Nine Herbs Charm. And as I address each of the herbs, um, I take them and I'm pounding them um, to a powder as I speak to each of the herbs. Um, and more, more um, details of preparation will follow after I do this part. You know, so here, here I am with my mortar and, and pestle and, and my poor, poor sick patient resting on my bed. And I say, pick up the mugwort, and I say, Remember thou, mugwort, what you made known, what you spoke at the gathering of the rain of the great gods. Um, you were called Una, the oldest of herbs. You have power against three and against thirty. You have power against poison and against infection. You have power against the loathsome foe roving through the land. And you, plantain, mother of herbs, open from the east, mighty inside, over you wagons creaked, over you queens rode, over you brides cried out, over you bulls snorted. You withstood all of them, you danced, dashed against them. May you likewise withstand poison and infection, and the loathsome foe roving through the land. Stuna is the name of this herb. It grew on a stone. It stands up against poison, it dashes against pain. Unyielding it is called, it dashes against poison. It drives out the hostile one, it casts out poison. This is the herb that fought against the snake. It has power against poison, it has power against infection. It has power against the loathsome foe roving through the land. Put to flight now, venom loather, the greater poisons, though you are the lesser. You, the mightier, conquer the lesser poisons until she is cured of both. Remember chamomile, what you made known, what you accomplished at Ayler Ford, that never a man should lose his life from infection after chamomile was prepared for his food. This is the herb that is called werdulu. 
A seal scented across the sea ridge, a vexation to poison, a help to others. It stands against pain, it stands against poison, it has power against three and against thirty, against the hand of a fiend and against mighty devices, against the spell of mean creatures. There the apple accomplished it against poison, that never would the loathsome serpent dwell in the house. Turville and Finnell, two very mighty ones. They were created by the wise Brighton, holy where he hung in heaven. He sent and set and sent them to the seven worlds, to the wretched and the fortunate as a help to all. These nine have power against nine poisons. A worm came crawling, it killed nothing, for Woden took thin nine glory twigs. He smote them the adder that it flew apart into nine parts. Now these nine herbs have power against nine evil spirits against nine poisons and against nine infections, against the red poison, against the foul poison, against the white poison, against the purple poison, against the yellow poison, against the green poison, against the black poison, against the blue poison, against the brown poison, against the crimson poison, against worm blister, against water blister, against thorn blister, against thistle blister, against ice blister, against poison blister. If any poison comes flying from the east, or any from the north, or any from the south, or any from the west among the people, Christ stood over diseases of every kind. I alone know a running stream, and the nine adders beware of it. May all the weeds spring up from their roots, the seas slip apart, all salt water, when I blow this poison from you. And now, having pounded the herbs to a powder, um, I mix them with old soap and the juice of the apple. Um, then I prepare a paste of water and ashes, boil fennel with the paste, and wash it with a beaten egg um, when I apply this salve. And I sing this charm repeatedly over the herbs. Really, it should be three times on each of the herbs preparing, and likewise on the apple. Um, and then sung into the mouth of the patient, both ears, um, and on any wounds or blisters around before applying the salve. Um, and one, you know, properly performed, this is very impressive. Um, both my patient and I are firmly, firmly convinced it's going to work. Um, and, you know, the, the chamomile will re reduce the inflammation, um, may, may even um, relieve, pa relieve pain and itch a bit. You know, the plantain is, is going to be a good protection against anything getting into those blisters and horribly infecting them. Um, and so forth. Unfortunately, we don't know what um, all the herbs are. That's one problem with these. They use common names and we're not always sure. Um, but we can say it's a pretty good job that um, there is going to be a physical effect. Um, and also, um, you notice that there, there's an apple being used. The apple juice is, is fairly crucial um, to this. Um, and in the event that those blisters and other forms of distress were, were actually caused by or, or contributed to by scurvy, um, here she is getting some fresh fruit juice. So basically you have this amazing almost performance. But yeah, very, 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 very definitely a performance. Which I find fascinating because this is being done in, in this book that you took us from, this would have been done by a presumably Catholic monk. Presumably but he's, Catholic monk. But he's, he's still calling on Woden, and yeah, because and that's how it's done. Calling on Woden, and you see weird things. Um, the Brighton as he hung in heaven could, could, if you're a Christian, be applying to Christ, um, could also be referring to Woden. Um, and then it talks about sending them out through the seven worlds. Now, seven is the classic southern magic number. Um, and that seems to have somehow gotten in for our more usual nine. I was wondering about that because the other thing this reminded me of is a little bit later, if you are reading things, you know, discussions of physicians in the Middle Ages, when they've sort of rediscovered Aristotle and some of the classical motifs, they don't actually call on, on Jupiter or, or Zeus or Hermes, but they, they actually talk about Hermes a lot and they wouldn't. You know, I'm not sure they would do quite the same invocation, but there's a lot of things that come in from the South and from the Greek because, well, that's how Aristotle said it was done. Yeah. So I, I think it's, I don't think it's so much that they're still practicing the, the, the 
officially a pagan religion, but they're, they're that's how healing's done. Yeah, and you, you can't really draw that clear line as to when um, the Anglo-Saxons um, stopped practicing pagan religion. Certainly the, um, if you like, the official cult of the Assyr, the official worship, you know, it ended at the official conversions. Um, but on the other hand, people then continue to make their offerings at elder trees in particular were popular, um, at ho holy streams, holy sites. And then, of course, you get the Norse influx. So by the, the, by the 900s or so, when um, you, you get a priest ranting about people and pagan superstitions, you don't really know, is this a tradition that just kept going among the English? Is this something the Norse brought in? Uh, is it something that overlapped and people just kept doing it? But what, one of the, the biggest changes, actually, in terms of medicine and culture um, that we see in the Anglo-Saxon and don't see starting in the Norse until after the conversion um, is that primarily um, the role of healing um, was a more of a women's art. Um, it wasn't not to the same extreme degree as spinning. You get the occasional um, male physician, the occasional man with healing knowledge, and it's not considered unmanly. Um, it's just that mostly women were the people who did it, and mo most things would be probably dealt with by the mother of the house. Um, and there are some, again, we don't have nearly the detail we'd like in Scandinavia, um, but what we do have is this very strong custom um, that if you could afford any sort of garden, and you probably could because you were growing your food in it, among other things, um, there would be what was called the Angelica Garth or the Leaf Garth, um, and that was the Providence seat of power um, equivalent of office space um, for the mother of the house. Um, she was responsible for um, growing the healing herbs, looking after her family, um, and she also, if she had any kind of money at all, and if she didn't, she might have a, a very, you know, cheap or personally handmade version, um, she would have a casket. And in this casket, she would keep her, her small treasures, um, an awful lot of the caskets that have been found in grave goods um, also have very distinctly amuletic items in them. She, so she um, would keep her, her healing amulets, her magic, some of her herbs, um, her protection for the family, and the things she needed to treat, you know, all, all the little, little ailments that a family gets over time. I think the idea of ladies having boxes is, is pretty, almost universal. Yes. Um, one of the questions I have, too, is, what uh, in, in any of the sources is there any very much information on childbirth or uh, any kind of magic or, or healing or customs um, associated with it? In folklore, a fair bit. Um, in the old Norse sources, um, not not very much. Um, there's a couple of possibly late and romantic um, references um, to fr calling on Frigg or Freya at a birth. Um, and you know, the, there's a, a couple of folklore customs which also imply that you know may, maybe this was being done. Um, it was obviously a concern. Um, staves to help in midwifery are listed, for instance, in Sigurd Rifamal among the many things um, Sigurd Rif is instructing Sigurd in. Um, so we can assume that somebody who was um, considered wise, considered knowledgeable, um, that that assisting in birthing would would be considered part of their normal activities. Um, so the answer is there was probably a humongous amount, and sadly not a humongous amount, has survived. Because I, I think um, this is a slight segue, but it is on the topic of childbirth and medicine. We when we were on our honeymoon, we went to uh, Aarhus in Denmark, where there's a museum, and I and they have uh, people that had to be have their graves disturbed have been reburied or in some cases interred in the museum but in a very respectful way as they were found and some of the earliest stone age burials are of young mothers with their children and there was one in particular where she's buried with her presumably newborn infant on a swan's wing on her arm and just the sheer number of them makes you think that this must have been a topic that people were concerned about absolutely um i i don't see any way there could not have been 
and would this probably be the reason why, as is true in many cultures, women had been the traditional healers, that and the fact that that's also, the home would be where you would retreat back to after a battle, or where you would go home if you were sick in the fields. I think there's a, I think there's a lot of things contributing to it. Um, partially, um, it was a question of spheres of influence. Um, the, the herb garden was the woman's provenance. Um, partially, um, women were generally expected to have a bit closer communication with the other world, um, and women were, were expected to be wise. They were expected to be the advice givers. They were expected to be the people who knew what to do when there was a problem. You know, they might not be the ones that actually went out to deal with it. The classic Icelandic paradigm um, was the mother of grown son saying, now, Sonny, that guy insulted our family. You go kill his butt. Um, that that was pretty common. But um, I think it's the, the combination of the particularly special magical and spiritual role with the practical role of being the family gardener. A gardener, and also when I was doing a preparation for a talk on women's roles, I noticed an awful lot of comparison between cooking, which is probably one of the earliest, other than the obvious, uh, procreation. Uh, procreation and, and, and preparation of food seem to be go way, way, way back wherever we find campfires and we can determine something about the sex of who's manning Absolutely. them. Absolutely, and here... Uh, with the preparation of food in particular, food and drink, because women were pri the primary brewers as well, um, not to mention the ones with the right to distribute the drink, um, we see this interesting dual view of the feminine in this um, regard, because on the one hand you have the healer, um, on the other hand you have the poisoner, um, and they they're both have a strong magical component to them, um, both, both very, very strongly associated with magical practice. Um, but our ancestors were very well aware that somebody um, who knew, knew their herbs, knew their spells, and could heal, could also kill with them. Um, and we don't, poisoning wasn't nearly as popular in the North as it was, say, in Rome. Um, but we do see a number of notable female figures um, who are poisoners or at least um, dark sorceresses in this regard. And I, I'm thinking in particular of Volsunga Saga um, with um, Sigmunder's wife poisoning Sintiatli um, and then of, of Greenhild and her various mind-altering brews, um, that, which contained a, a, contained a number of interesting things. Happily, we did get the recipes for those. And they can be found in a couple of novels, such as Ryan Gold's Initialist Treasure. I'm also curious about, because I know that we see a certain amount of snake motifs in the North. Were they associated with medicine as they like they were in the South? I don't think they were quite as strongly associated with medicine, but there was certainly some association. We, we find um, bits of snake, mummified snakes and the like, um, together with, with other um, amulets and indeed practical tools of healing, even in the Bronze Age. Um, we actually find them together with surgical imp implements in a couple of um, chieftain King Wise Men's burials. Um, we find them occasionally in the Viking Age. Um, and in terms of imagery, um, this again takes us right back to the poison versus healing thing. In, Telemark, um, Norway, um, there is a quote saying that every snake has two tongues, a poison tongue and a healing tongue. Um, so yes, there, there are a number of folk customs related to it. Um, one of the problems with determining exactly the significance of a snake in any given context is that they were such general pillars of power. Um, one of my favorite quotes um, I, um, from one, one of my fellow academic people is, and the snake here um, either stands for fertility, protection, or evil. And I'm like, yeah, that doesn't leave a, a lot of other options, does it? Um, but it, but it's true. Um, you know, the, the snake wouldn't be um, as directly and closely identified um, with medicine as in the South with the, the snakes of Asclepius, um, where they were actually, you know, kind of the most crucial diagnostic instrument. The snakes were sort of proto-tricorder back in those days. 
that yes, there was a, some conception. Of the One reason I wondered was because as you were reading the charm, it kept referring to venom over and over again, and I thought sometimes when in cultures when things are very powerful, you, you can be powerful for good. You know, you, you want something even as powerful to counteract the bad power. You want the good power exactly, and and that's exactly the way it is with with the snake in the Germanic. You know, it is uh, ab- above all. Um, it is a raw embodiment of power, but, but whether that's good, good power or destructive power mostly mostly depends on context. And I think finally, we touched on this earlier, but you mentioned surgical instruments. What, what sort of instruments would a, 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 a Germanic healer have had? Um, a Germanic healer, well, there, there was a um, woman's grave um, in Iceland, which is, is believed to be the grave of a physician. Um, her accoutrements um, included um, tweezers. They included beeswax, which you know was going to be important for compounding various um, medicaments, ointments, and have you. Um, a large number of clear um, chalcedony quartz stones. Um, again, probably for for their um, magical healing purposes. Um, other other surgical instruments. Um, the Bro- Bronze Age burials. Um, included very small, very very fine bronze knives, um, very very well sharpened. You know, could could have done quite a decent job of surgery with them. Um, we find herbal things again. We don't know whether the thin vein seeds um, buried with the pure cat witch were something um, she was using for her for herself um, as an entheogen, um, or whether she was using them to treat patients with as a painkiller, um, or both. Quite possibly, um, I'm not. I'm not sure if we had actual arrow spoons in the north or not. Um, I know they had been popular um, among the Greeks and the Romans for What's ages. What's an arrow spoon? Um, an arrow spoon. Um, it's kind of a spoon-like item um, that you know you've got an arrow in the wound and the head's got barbs in. Uh, if you don't want to shove it all the way through, so you can chop off the head. Um, you kind of slide the two, these two spoony things in, um, encompass and encompass the barb so you can pull it out without ripping the flesh. So you know, this was a, a crucial surgical tool of the Roman armies, of course. And that leads me to another question. A lot of cultures you find skulls with uh, evidence of uh, trying to attempt like uh, brain surgery to re- remove pressure. Is there any of that in the north? Um, we certainly did prep panning in the Stone Age. Um, now there's one interesting find. Um, it's an, an, an actual um, fragment of skull from Denmark. A hole has certainly been bored in it, and there is an inscription um, to to the gods on it. Um, kind of a difficult inscription. There's a n- number of different um, interpretations, um, but it, it seems um, to to be calling the gods to help, possibly against the will of the dwarf. Um, now. Um, I, I think there's some question as to when, when this hole was bored. Um, it may have been bored you know, long after it was no longer in a living person for making an amulet, um, or it could be a reference to trepanning. And, and what about uh, cradle boarding? I, I seem to recall in one of your novels that some of the Germanic people had the uh, elongated heads that uh, you get the, from... The, Bur- the Burgundians... Um, picked up from the Huns the habit of binding baby skulls to elongate them to fit them into helmets better. Um, As far as I know, the Burgundians were the only ones that did it, and they got that straight off the Huns, I think. Because I I know you find that in Peru, and very often they'll, you know, you see, you'll see on, again, some of the more interesting areas of the internet, you'll see, you know, alien skull found, and it's not... There are a couple that, that really have been very unusual and difficult with DNA analysis, but 99% of the time, it's just somebody who's in infancy, had their uh, had their baby's head, you flatten it against a board for a year, and it'll get this long, kind of weird looking. It's thought that some of the pharaohs may have done this too. Uh, they're, they're not certain. But in any case, I think that uh, this has been really, really interesting, and I think we, it's kind of given us a really good overview, including that brilliant diagnosis. Yeah, well, one of the... Actually... Probably the last thing I, I want to mention, again, in, in terms of herbs and, and the holistic view of the world, um, is that the plants and trees um, that our forebears considered most spiritually or magically powerful 
were almost inevitably the ones with the strongest medicinal effect. Um, apples, um, onions, garlics, the whole allium family, um, elder trees, um, a particular place in Anglo-Saxon England, um, we know because I think Wolfstan was um, particularly complaining about people worshipping in elder trees, um, huge, huge place um, in folklore um, throughout the, the northern world, um, and of course it is one of the best possible medicines um, for flu, flu, colds, and other nasty respiratory fevery sort of viruses. As we've, we've seen plant, plantain in particular, which um, I've used myself very successfully on many occasions for things like strep throat. Um, all, all of these, the, the more powerful something is as a physical medicine, um, the more powerful it was understood to be in the other world as well, because the two are not really to the Germanic mind separated. You, know, you can't, can't treat just one aspect of a, a patient. Um, you can't deal with just one aspect of anything, um, because you just really can't separate the two out. I think that uh, lack of separation or that modern distinction we make between here and there is probably something that would be almost worth a show on its own because it's it's or at least part of a show because it's it's something that's really hard for westerners to get their head around we really make a distinction between what happens in the physical and what happens in what we perceive as the spiritual and even even people who are trying very hard not to do this st you still do because we're all products of how we're raised to a degree you know what um medicine is just now starting to um, look back at the, the possibility of a, a bit more of an integrative approach. Um, now, the, the school I go to, my medical school, Royal College of Surgeons Ireland, is quite conservative, um, but one of the things we, we did look at was the wide, wide field defined as complementary and alternative medicines. Um, and one of, one of the things that our lecturer pointed out is that um, a lot of people do go, for instance, um, to homeopaths um, and do seem to get um, some real benefit out of it, despite the fact that there is absolutely no, no physical substance in it whatsoever. Um, but something is clearly happening. Um, and the, the crucial thing seems to be that the homeopathic practitioner is likely to listen, listen to the patient for a lot longer listen to them talk about their personal life, their stresses, think about their personality, um, and is likely to prescribe a remedy um, based on a combination of the personality and personal issues and the actual physical ailment. Um, now, what they're actually giving out is distilled water, um, but the whole process of attention, um, of ritual, of the idea that something is being done which engages the mental and possibly the spiritual faculties um, as well as the hypothetical and in fact non-existent physical effects of the homeopathy, that actually seems to do people some good. Um, and that's an aspect which I, I think modern medicine would be well advised to consider bringing back. Um, now sadly I'm mostly not treating um, Viking Age Scandinavians or even early Anglo-Saxons, um, and I'm not sure how much confidence would be instilled in um, the average, um, you know, old, old fellow from Ireland with rheumatoid arthritis if, if I started chanting weird stuff o o over him. Um, but I think it's worthwhile to seriously think about um, what our ancestors did know, what they did understand, um, and what we have lost and could bring back to add on top of our splendid, wonderful, excellent technology, antibiotics, and all the amazing things we can do on the physical side. I would say that would, in the current cultural situation in the West, I would say that is the one, the one place where the Gothi or Githia or the priest or priestess can step in because they are almost essentially going to have to do that other half for the present day. I mean, you are going to occasionally get really uh, good doctors like you, but you or you will be, but you you won't even know necessarily unless the patient tells you that they would be interested in such a thing. 
you know, a, a second a second half of the healing process. But I think that's something to look into is the fact that where if you know I, I'm I'm that person today and I go to my doctor and I have but because I, I know we looked this up in the book I have measles I can go to my lovely doctor here in Ireland and she can give me pills and but I could come home and you could do the uh, version of that ceremony for me exactly. and we would have both together and I guess that's what I'm aiming at is that I think that there maybe there needs to be a little more attention sometimes because you, you go to I go to particularly to certain not not I haven't seen many in obstetry but pagan healing circles where there's a all the emphasis, though, is on the spiritual. And I, I think looking to see how we can work them together. Yeah, and you, you have to have both. You know, it, it's like that old joke. Um, the guy wants to win the lottery, so he, he prays to Freya, who's, you know, the lady of mobile wealth and gold, and he prays to her and makes offerings to her over and over. No no, no lottery win. So he, he here he is, you know, in his hope, and he's saying, Freya, Freya, I, I prayed, I I followed you, I've made these offerings, I still haven't won the lottery yet. And Freya says to him, well, yes, you've done all that, and that's very good, but look, guy, you need to meet me halfway, at least buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> and I think that's a great note to, uh, to to close this show on. I want to thank you very, very much for coming this evening. It's been really fun, and I look forward to having you back again. Okay. And you've been, everyone, you've been listening to Cat's Eye on the Future. And we look forward to seeing you again next time. Good night. But here's a health to the company and one to my last. You have been listening to Cat's Eye on the Future, the show where we take a glimpse of the energies coming soon into your world and into your future. Be sure to join us again next time when we explore another chapter of Cat's Eye on the Future. But here's a health to the company and one to my last. Let us drink and be merry all out of one glass. Let us drink 